So um, this afternoon we hope to tell you a little bit of a story about what we're doing here. And I know everybody's heard about the whole bench to bedside, bedside to bench in oncology. I think that's where we're going and that's where every academic institution is doing. But we're going to give you a little twist on that story because whereas Dr. Gina Kaku is a PhD and I'm an MD and we do prostate cancer research, for what we're going to discuss today, how we had a clinical problem and we actually went to a bioengineer in Cornell Ithaca to help us solve that problem. So I think it's more than the whole the bench to bedside, the traditional, it's really incorporating the physical sciences and how we can use the physical sciences to answer clinical questions. And, uh, I think this was the vision of the NIH when they developed these physical sciences oncology centers, the concept being how can we take advantage of our technology, our physical sciences to get people that do this interested in medicine and specifically in cancer and cancer research. Uh, the best way to do that, of course, is to give them money, right, to fund them. And they set up this grant system where you had to have a combination of physicians and, or you know, frontline people like myself as well as physical science people like Brian working together and that was the grant. So this grant is situated, the primary space is in Cornell Ithaca but there's three co-PIs here in uh, at Cornell Ithaca, myself being one and Dr. Ginnikaku being another of the different projects. We're not going to talk about all the projects today but uh, we focus on metastases. Uh, that's more or less what our physical science is center focuses on, uh, and we'll, you'll see that when we uh, talk about this today. I want to say one other thing uh, before I forget that is very unique about this, and that is when Dr. Kirby uh, coincidentally had his sabbatical come up, so basically he was been there for eight years, as you heard, I guess after seven years you get a sabbatical year, and you could have chosen many places to go to, he decided to do his sabbatical at Wild Cornell here in New York. So for a year he was here, and uh, you know, he can tell you himself, but his, his desire to understand medicine and cancer research uh, was evident to all of us, and I think he accomplished that. And we joke because sometimes we'd have conversations, you see Brian writing things down, and then he told me, well, I, then he'd go to the computer and he'd look, you know, look up certain things, tumor suppressor genes, you know, P53, things that were obvious to us, but he never learned, and he educated himself, and I think that's one of the strengths of what we've accomplished is that Brian now has developed understanding of clinical medicine in terms of cancer, cancer care. Uh, so let me start out. I'm just going to give, we broke this into three different sections. I'm going to talk about the problem as a clinician and a clinician, you know, clinician, re clinical researcher. Brian's going to say, gee, let me see if I can help you with that problem uh, from a physical sciences uh, standpoint. And then Dr. Gina Kaku is going to show you how we're applying that and how her research is of answering these questions. So what is the problem? The problem is uh, prostate cancer. So many of you may know there'll be 240,000 estimated cases this year. It's the most common cancer in men and it's estimated the lifetime risk of anybody, of any male to get prostate cancer is one in six. Uh, I'm sure you uh, read the newspaper and you all know there's a controversy about PSA screening. I'm not going to speak about that. Uh, some of this is early prostate cancer that we do diagnose in the U.S., but nevertheless, 28,000 men are ex expected to die this year, and it's 9.3 percent of all cancer deaths in males, and after lung cancer, it is the most common cause of cancer-related death, death in the U.S. So this is how we think of uh, prostate cancer. I know this seems like a complicated slide, but I'm going to really break it down uh, simply for you, and we think of prostate cancer as states, different states. Patients move from one state to the other uh, as they go through the life. Sometimes they don't move. Sometimes they stay in one state and, and they die of other causes. But starting early with localized disease, then patients, uh, their PSA, which is this marker, regardless of whether it's used for screening, can be used to follow patients. Uh, they can develop uh, metastases where they still haven't had therapy, the cardinal therapy being androgen deprivation therapy or lowering testosterone, just like testosterone stimulates the normal prostate to grow, it stimulates prostate cancer to grow. So the treatment is to castrate patients. So you can have clinical metastases where you're not castrate, then we'll 
treatment would be castration, usually chemical with the medications. And then you have patients that are already castrate, meaning that they're on therapy and they develop metastases or they progress. Uh, and this is when you start uh, going down the pathway of where you're unfortunately likely, like, likely to die of prostate cancer. Uh, and the way we treat it is, you know, historically with chemotherapy. Today, there's many new treatments you've heard about. I'm, again, I'm not going to talk about the Cipolucil T, Abiraterone, and others. Uh, but we're going to focus on chemotherapy because at some point in most men's life, they, they live long enough, the cancer progresses long progresses, they will need chemotherapy. And that's still the number one treatment and a treatment that has shown to improve how long patients live. Today we have uh, docetaxel chemotherapy, which is the most commonly used chemotherapy. It's still, since 2004, is the uh, gold standard. We've tried to improve on it, but we've been unsuccessful to date with many different clinical trials, still the gold standard. And then another drug called cabazitaxel was recently approved after it show, it was shown that after docetaxel chemotherapy stopped working, if you gave another chemotherapy, cabazitaxel, patients would live longer too. So we have two chemotherapies, which Dr. Ginokaku will go into, are from the same class, which we call taxanes, and she'll discuss what that means. I'm not going to on, go into that. But just keep in mind, two chemotherapies, they improve survival. Uh, and they're in the same class. Mm -hmm. So what are the unmet needs that, as a clinician, I'm trying to assess, and myself and other genital urinary oncologists? So we want to understand, you know, prognosis. We want to be able to predict who, which patients will go from one state to the other. We want to predict which drug will work in what patient, meaning that, uh, you know, we, there's the whole concept of targeted therapy, used to be we just give everything to everybody and see if it worked. Now we try and say, well, this is going to work in you and that's going to work in him and really target and, and tailor therapy or personalized medicine, personalized cancer therapy. But how do we achieve that? How do we match the drug to the patient? How do we know if the treatment's working? So right now we give chemotherapy. Maybe it's working, maybe it's not. We have to wait two, three, four months. Maybe it's going to help a patient, maybe not. We're not that skilled at in prostate cancer, we are in some of the other tumor types, but in prostate cancer is figuring out which patients are going to benefit from chemotherapy. Uh, after we start the chemotherapy, will it be useful? And predicting which patients we should actually give the chemotherapy to. So as a clinician, I have this problem. As I uh, alluded to before, there's many drugs that are available. Some of these are FDA approved. Recently at ASCO, this drug and this drug have both been shown to improve survival. They will be FDA approved within the next year. So the good news is, gee, there's a lot of things going on. For myself, I've been in this field for a long time, never had so many drugs I can treat a patient with. The challenge is, well, which patient gets which drug when? And that's what we're trying to answer because of toxicity uh, and uh, sequencing and trying to figure in cost, et cetera. So docetaxel and cabazitaxel are taxanes, but the problem with this type of chemotherapy is it's very toxic. Uh, you get anemia, low white blood count, et cetera, typical chemotherapy. So even though I'm giving it to patients and maybe it works half the time, half the time patients are getting toxicity without benefit. We don't really know some of the mechanisms of sensitivity and resistance to this tr type of treatment. Uh, we know uh, from other diseases that and in prostate cancer you can do very sophisticated genomic and epigenomic uh, analyses to try and predict this. We haven't really reached that state yet for, to answer the question about, about chemotherapy. We don't really have a biomarker to tell us which patients are going to respond. We really don't understand why some patients respond and why some patients are resistant to this chemotherapy. So there's all these unanswered questions. So the, how would you answer that? Well, if we look at other tumor types, the, probably the best way to answer that is to look at the cancer tissue itself, right? So if we can take a patient with metastatic prostate cancer and analyze this tumor tissue, that would be a great way to try and figure out which, is he going to respond? Is he has this gene expressed? Is he going to be resistant? Is that gene expressed? But there's one major challenge in prostate cancer. Your typical patient had his prostate out five or seven years ago, 10, 15 years ago. That's the tissue we have available, a prostate 
Today he comes to me and he's got cancer in his bone. So he's got bone metastases, which is the most common place and uh, that you have metastases. So you're saying, well, can I do a bone biopsy and analyze the tumor tissue? And it's A, very challenging. You don't necessarily get a lot of tumor tissue to analyze. B, it's painful. You know, you have to tell a patient, I want to stick uh, some needles in your bone. You're never going to get a lot of tissue because it's a needle biopsy. So it's a big challenge of, I know what I want to do. I want to analyze the patient's tumor tissue, but how do I do it in a prostate cancer patient? Is it relevant to look at his prostate from five or seven years ago to the cells that are now circulating? What if it was one in a million cells back then that survived his surgery that's causing the metastases? So looking at the primary tumor may not give me any information. That's the challenge. So how can we get around this challenge? Well, if we think about metastases and how, and this ties in again to the whole PSOC, how do things spread, basically you have a tumor and the tumor cells go through a transformation and they break down and they go into the bloodstream and they circulate and then they can go to the bone or the liver or brain or other tissue and these are circulating tumor cells. So there's literally cells in your circulation that leave the primary tumor and, and cause spread. And if we can isolate these cells and we can analyze these cells, might this not be a surrogate or a, an ability for us to analyze prostate cancer tumor tissue. So that is the concept, that is the challenge. How do we get you know, one in a million, 10 million, six million cells that are cancer cells out of the circulation that we can then analyze it, analyze those cells and use that information to help guide therapy for patients with prostate cancer, with metastatic prostate cancer. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Thanks. So as, as Blaine said, my name is Brian Kirby and I'm, a, uh, I'm an engineer. I work in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department in Ithaca. And what I'll try to talk about is bridging the gap. Um, we have a clinician who's interested in uh, helping patients and wants to do that um, with information about their tissue. And we have a pharmacologist who's an expert on what happens if she can look at those tissues. So my job is to get them the tissue. So. What I show here are two images that I'll explain in, in the coming slides. This is a top view of a microfluidic device, and you should think of these gray circles as being approximately 100 microns in size. So it's about the size of a human hair. And uh, these are some images of some cells, and this is a hint at the sort of stuff that uh, Evie is doing. So I'm gonna make a device with little obstacles that are about the size of a human hair to capture these cancer cells so that Evie can, can tell me more about what they do. And the, the big picture, the idea is to be able to go from a sample that a patient is happy to give, which is blood, to some sort of answer about the functional response of these cancer cells. So we don't wanna just count the cells up, we don't wanna just find out what their genetic material is, but we wanna see like what exactly do they do when they're exposed to a chemotherapeutic. Because if we know what the cells do in response to a chemotherapeutic, we hope to be able to predict what they'll do clinically. So we wanna be able to predict the response of prostate cancer patients to chemotherapy. And my job is to get what we call circulating tumor cells on chip so that uh, Dr. Gianna Kaku can do a functional analysis. But this really is a needle in the haystack problem. And the reason is because the cancer cells that we're looking for in the bloodstream might be approximately one in a billion. So a milliliter of blood has about five billion cells and we're looking for a population of cells that might only have one or five or 20. So I'm looking for a needle in a haystack. And the question is, how do I do that? Well, we decided to do that with a micro device. This is a silicon micro device that's about one centimeter by two centimeters in size. And the basic idea is that we coat this device with an antibody. And so this is a chemical that is, will stick specifically to cancer cells. And when we do that, we coat this with a chemical. We take this small device, we put a little silicone gasket on it. We flow some blood through. In this case, we flow about one milliliter of blood. And when we do that, we expect that we'll capture a number of cells. And the key thing is that we want these cells to be the cancer cells, these needle in a haystack, one in a billion sort of cells. If we've done that right, we can rinse this off, we can remove this gasket, and I'm left with a small device that now is enriched for cancer cells. And again, it has to be enriched by a very large uh, amount for this to be effective. So if you look at this slide, 
it motivates a couple of different things. We have a technique that we call geometrically enhanced uh, differential immunocapture, and we pronounce it JEDI because we like to make hints at Star Wars. If you look at this top view again, these are obstacles that are about the size of a human hair. And now the question is, how do I capture this elusive cancer cell, this one in a billion thing? Well, the first thing I do is I make a device that is sticky, but only sticky to the cancer cells. But it turns out that isn't enough. What you need to do is you need to add something else, which I've called fluid mechanical trickery. And the idea is we take advantage of the fact that most cancer cells are bigger than blood cells. And because they're bigger and because they're a little bit more rigid than other cells, you can trick them into going down different paths than a microfluidic device. When you do that, you can get those cells to collide with a sticky surface many different times. And so what this graph, what this image shows is uh, an image of flow moving from left to right through a bunch of obstacles. And you can see these paths in different colors that basically show how cells of different sizes would move. And you can see that these paths are different. And the net effect of this is that we get the cancer cells to collide with these sticky surfaces a lot, and we get the blood cells to collide with them not very much. Now, the reason I make the reference to Price is Right is I don't know how many people remember the Plinko game from Price is Right, but it was this game where you had a bunch of things and you put a disc in and the disc bounced around. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit analogous to that in the sense that we make this device with this maze of these different obstacles, but we study those obstacles in great detail to make sure that the cells we're interested in follow on, along this path. So we're tricking these cells again to go down this path that will lead to a bunch of obstacles. Now, the net effect of this is that we can come up with some quantitative measures of how well this works. And so a test case is to take a milliliter of blood, which has about 5 billion cells, and you can put a small number of cancer cells in. In this example, we put in 200. And we basically found that we could run this device. And when we put in these cancer cells, we captured most of them, maybe 85%. And we captured very few blood cells. And so we've gone from a case where the cells we were looking at were 200 out of 5 billion, and in this case are 170 out of 261. And so the net, effect of, the net effect of this is that we've concentrated these cancer cells by a factor of somewhere between 10 and 100 million. Now what this enables, and I won't talk about it, I'll leave that for Dr. Gianna Kaku, once, we've, once we have these cells, then we can ask questions about what they're doing. What is their genetic content? How do they respond to chemotherapeutics? And that's something that Dr. Gianna Kaku has done in detail. And so this is just a, oop, this is just a hint of some images uh, that were taken in her lab using cells that were captured in the devices that we designed. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. So I've just updated my presentation a little bit. So because I would like you to show you a couple of movies that uh, I think take the message home. version 4. Okay. Maybe I will move the folder to the desktop. As David explained to you earlier, taxanes currently are the only chemotherapy that improves survival in metastatic prostate cancer patients. Currently, there are three FDA-approved taxanes, paclitaxel, docetaxel, and cabazitaxel. Now, with this, with the focus on the taxanes, I'm going to give you a short historical perspective on the field. So, when we talk about taxol discovery and evolution, it, it all started with the NCI screening program, where in 1960, they found that the extract of the Pacific uterine, Taxus brevifolia, was effective, had anti-cancer activities against cell lines. Chemists then went to the extracts and isolated taxol. This is the chemical structure of taxol in 1971. 
In 1978, Taxol showed great efficacy against uh, tumors in animal models. <laughs> and in 1979, it was Susan Horwitz who discovered its unique mechanism of action. Taxol uh, was the prototype of a drug that binds tubulin and stabilizes macrotubules. In 1993, we have the first FDA approval for the clinical use of Taxol for breast and ovarian cancer. Now, fast forward today. What do we know today? We know that taxanes have the broadest clinical applications among all classes of chemotherapeutics. Yet, clinical success is hampered by the development of drug resistance, which means that a tumor in a patient is originally responsive to taxane treatment, and then over time it becomes resistant. Now, drug resistance is the number one cause of cancer-related deaths in metastatic patients. So it is a huge problem. So today, 20 years, almost 20 years, following Taxol's entry to the clinic, we still fail to understand the mechanisms of drug resistance in patients. And this is not due to lack of trying. Actually, if you do a PubMed search, since uh, the first description of Taxol's mechanism of action in 1979, there are 23,000 papers and hundreds of labs worldwide that are working on mechanisms of action of taxanes and mechanisms of resistance. So what is the problem? Why can we not understand clinical drug resistance? A major problem is that hum human tumors evolve over time, so they're not the same as in initial diagnosis, and especially following drug selection pressure. So archival tumor material obtained at initial diagnosis of the patient may not be relevant for metastatic patients. So the lack of available tumor tissue from metastatic patients is a major barrier to solving the problem of drug resistance. So the solution to that problem is the availability now of circulating tumor cells that allow us to gain a portal into the uh, tissue, uh, the, the tumor tissue from individual patients. So at this juncture, we have been very fortunate uh, to collaborate with uh, Dr. Kirby, who developed a great microfluidic device, the JEDI, that allows us to capture circulating tumor cells from the blood of metastatic patients using just one ml of blood. And now I'm going to show you what we can do with these CTCs. One assay on the chip is enumeration. Uh, could we dim the front lights? <coughs> Thank you. Enumeration means we count how many CTCs are there. So this is not unique to our device. Several other uh, microfluidic devices and the CTC capture technologies focus on counting. And counting can provide information on the CTC numbers over the course of the treatment for the same patient. However, counting alone cannot help us understand why a patient responds or fails drug treatment. So the second assay that we do on the chip, we uh, assess effective drug target engagement. So now I'm going to give you three introductory slides to explain how Taxol works at the cellular level so you can appreciate what we're trying to assay here. So this is a, a cancer cell. You see the uh, nucleus in blue and microtubules that are the cellular target of Taxol are shown in green. You can see we have an extensive filamentous network that covers the entire area of the cytoplasm of the cell. Microtubules are very important for cell division and several other processes here, this is the movie I wanted to show you. Let's see. Hopefully it will play. <coughs> so these are, it does not play yet, but these are live microtubules. They continuously grow and shrink. They're very dynamic. Every single cell in our body has microtubules, and they're dynamic 24-7. This is what they do for a living. By being dynamic, uh, there are also highways that allow um, direction of incoming signals to the cell. When you treat cells with a taxane, the microtubules get chopped and they do not move as, as much. And we have recently shown that 
an important mechanism that can explain how taxanes work in prostate cancer specifically is because they inhibit the nuclear accumulation of the androgen receptor driven by testosterone, which drives metastatic prostate cancer. So going back to the chip, how are we looking to assess the uh, drug target engagement by taxanes? We looked at microtubule bundling. This is what Axel does when it binds cellular microtubules. And we look at for the presence of the androgen receptor in the cytoplasm. So these are hallmarks showing uh, how, the, how taxanes work. And this allows us to monitor drug efficacy on target in real time. Why is this important? Because it can potentially allow for early clinical interve intervention. Once we see that the drug is not working on the target, and this assess can be done weekly or monthly, then uh, the clinician can change the course of treatment to give more effective chemotherapy. The other asset that we're developing on the capture CTCs is deep sequencing. We're trying to understand which genes are involved in drug resistance. Uh, this information can be used to identify new druggable targets, and eventually it has the potential to lead to the development of more uh, effective therapeutics. Finally, this is a, a unique assay that our team has developed. No other uh, microfluidic device or CTC groups have developed this assay. This is a predictive assay on living CTCs. The circulating tumor cells that are captured are alive. So we have preliminary data that shows that if you treat them on the chip with the taxane that the patient is receiving, you can assess drug response, and this correlates with the clinical response of the patient. This is an example from one prostate cancer patient that David was treating in the clinic. We got one ml of blood, captured CTCs, and treated the patient with docetaxel. And the next day, we saw that tubulin does not respond to drug treatment. Then we went back to David, and he told us that this patient was indeed progressing on this drug. Uh, another ML from the same patient treated on the chip with paclitaxel, the other taxane. And here we see uh, signs of uh, CTC response, which would suggest that, that potentially, had we known this at the beginning, we could choose the taxane of choice that would have the maximum efficacy. So this predictive assay can allow for chemotherapy customization for the individual. So we're taking the chip to the clinic in a prospective clinical trial that is uh, sponsored by Sanofi Aventis. This is a multi-center phase two trial that evaluates the benefit of early switch from docetaxel to cabazitaxel, one or the other taxanes, and we have built in a ton of CTC assays to understand mechanisms of drug resistance, predict response, customize chemotherapy, um, um, and uh, explore all these molecular markers. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you, Abby. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off the question and answer just, just to get it rolling. So how I understand it is instead of sitting back and waiting for a patient, you, you give a drug to a patient and sitting back and wait to see if it takes effect. You can take what you're doing, look at the blood, take out the tumor cells, and get almost an instantaneous. Like within a day or two. Within a day or two, you can see whether the drugs are taking effect. Right. And therefore, if, if a drug is very, very toxic, you, you don't, and, and it's not responding. Yes, if a drug is ineffective, then currently we have a choice of three different taxanes and other chemotherapy drugs. So if the drug does not show efficacy on the circulating tumor cells, then uh, the clinician can choose a different drug and save time so we're, for the we're, cancer patients. We're saving several days. Now, and let, let me just, so this okay. is the goal that's not established. Okay. So biomarker development, you know, is a very high bar for biomarker development. Okay. Preliminary data suggests that this could be the case, that you could usually, you could predict resistance and sensitivity. In this trial, for instance, we had great discussions in the design of this trial, are we ready to use this assay to predict? And at the end of the day, we felt uh, we needed to 
prove it first. Okay. So the trial is designed, patient's therapy will be chosen and changed based on more established clinical parameters, but uh, we will be correlating the response that we see on the chip in our analysis, and at the end, it's over 100 patients on the trial, some, around 100 patients, you will be able to then see, did it really predict? We have another smaller study that we've done internally, that's a 70 patient trial. In this study, and the way uh, it's designed is you have day one and day eight. So it's right before you get chemotherapy, and then a week later, you do the biomarker analysis. And the concept would be, if it were true, that a week after the first dose, can you already tell, based on what you're seeing, is this chemotherapy going to be effective? Today, in the use clinical parameters, you'd say a patient has to be on three, three, four months sometimes before you'd make that determination. So the concept is, and that's in any biomarker, can you predict which, you know, with confidence which patients will respond? I think another important part of this particular trial is this whole concept of resistance because, you know, a number of patients are going to respond and then become resistant. And when Lucy, we're doing a lot of analyses, it's also at the time of relapse. Yeah. And then more sophisticated says, well, why did this patient relapse? What's going on here? Uh, and she didn't go into many of the mechanisms about uh, what that could be, but that's you know her area. That's what she does really: studying taxane sensitivity resistance. Now, I want to say one other thing. I'm sure you've heard about many other microfluidic devices, chip capture, etc. So what is so unique outside of what Brian said about this chip is, in, this is a prostate cancer specific chip. So most chips, uh, most microfluidic devices will go after epithelial cells, uh, and which may or, you know, there could be other epithelial cells. Uh, there's some questions how specific, are you missing some cells that lose expression of an epithelial antigen, uh, which is called EPCAM. This chip is, uh, uses an antibody developed by Dr. Neil Bander who at Weill Cornell, Neil's a professor of urology, has developed this, this same antibody is used to treat patients and we use it. It's very specific for prostate cancer. It recognizes a protein on the prostate cancer cell called prostate specific membrane antigen or PSMA. So this JEDI device not only incorporates what Brian is saying, but it incorporates prostate specificity. So we know we're getting prostate cancer cells. And Evie and Brian can talk about they're moving that to uh, there are, there's sometimes uh, in many cancers there are cell specific antigens. It's only on this cancer. For instance, HER2 nu is predominantly on breast cancer. It could be on other tumors, but predominantly on breast cancer. So you can take Brian's device, and they're working on this already, uh, going after HER2 nu or some other marker that's on the cell surface. So this. It's differentiated from some of the other devices by that for this study, it's a prostate cancer specific device using JEDI, uh, you know, JEDI device, microfluidics, et cetera. Um, and that's what distinguishes it from some of the other which aren't so specific that are available. Well, please ask questions. So, so I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, fascinating work. Second of all, are you in your in your study? Are you including only patients who have gone on to castration resistance company? And, and I'm taking this a step further, but isn't any circulating tumor cell by definition a, metast a metastatic cell? No. Okay. So recent data from other groups from the from the group of Dr. Haber, he showed that he can capture circulating tumor cells from early non-metastatic patients. So you cannot assume that because you have a tumor cell circulating, it's going to give rise to metastasis. It has to acquire the specific genetic changes that will allow it to home in to this okay, pathology. Okay, fair enough. Would, would your, your, your testing only for this PSMA membrane, could you devise this so that you would capture, and isn't that very broad and not specific, could you capture the things, for instance, the gene fusion that was linked to more aggressive cancers, yes. and are you going to be developing that? So, yeah, so um, <clears throat> we are working on a variety of different capture methodologies, uh, and those capture me methodologies can be specific to a specific organ of origin. They can be specific to uh, a specific change that the cell is, is undergoing. Mm -hmm. And those things can be correlated to metastatic potential or, or invasiveness. Okay. Um, when that can't, that, it's not always straightforward to link that specifically to a gene fusion that, that you asked about. 
Uh, and, and the questions you ask in, in different cancers are different. So prostate versus breast versus ovarian versus pancreatic are different. And the relative importance of early detection versus late detection or identifying metastatic potential early or late, the, the, the questions evolve depending on the, on the organ. But definitely, we're, we're actively doing, working on at least four different uh, types of cancer uh, in my lab with, in collaborations with Dr. Janakaku and Anis and others. So, just so for the G fusion also, yeah. we have developed the assay on the G so we can see which CTCs harbor that fusion in collaboration with Dr. Robin. He gave us a fusion specific antibody. In addition, the deep sequencing analysis will tell us whether a patient has these fusions or not. Mm -hmm. So, just keep in mind for cell capture, you're capturing whole cells, right? So, whatever antibody recognizes a protein, that protein must be on the surface of the cell. So gene fusion is the nucleus, so you couldn't really target that with an antibody unless there was a protein that was expressed. So that's what you have to keep in mind. Okay, okay. And then just finally, I know that Mary Ellen Taplin had, on your first screen, you had to add around, and I know she has increased, she's, she set the stage for moving out from castration resistance to treating much earlier, and I just wanted you to comment on that. So they just reported at ASCO uh, in a trial of patients pre-chemotherapy. The drug is currently FDA approved for post-docetaxel post chemotherapy, uh, showing that if patients who had had docetaxel chemotherapy, randomized to abiraterone versus placebo, the ones who uh, received abiraterone had improved survival, and the same type of study was done pre-chemotherapy, and basically showed um, an improvement in survival, significant improvement in survival. The concept, abiraterone is, uh, is not really chemotherapy. It's more, you can think of it more as a potent ho hormonal therapy. It affects the androgen signaling axis. Uh, so then it gets back to what I alluded to before, which is sequencing. We don't really know what's the best sequence. It may not even matter what the, you may, you may be diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer here and die here. If you get docetaxel, then abiraterone, abiraterone, then docetaxel may not make a difference. It's a, it's going to be a difficult issue to answer. We see that in other tumor types where there's multiple tumors, like, uh, multiple drugs, like in kidney cancers, there's a half a dozen FDA approved drugs. We still don't know if A, B, C is better than B, C, A, better than C, B, A. You know, we just don't know. So for abiraterone, most of us in the field do think that ultimately it will be moved up pre chemotherapy mm -hmm. because chemotherapy is certainly more toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's now it's going to go to the FDA to get approved, and I think once it is FDA approved in that, you could say in that state or in that phase of your illness before chemotherapy, it'll, it's likely to be used a lot at that time. Could, you could use it now though, if, if you want, it's already an approved drug. You can use it, you can use it but insurance, most insurance companies will not pay for it pre-chemotherapy, it's about five or six thousand a month, so some patients will pay for it, some insurance companies, based on the data, will allow it, it's a, really a case-by-case -case situation. And you can also use our device to assess whether abiraterone works mm. in the circulating tumor cells by looking at the amount of the androgen receptor in the nucleus versus the cytoplasm. So this has applicability to non tumor exactly. therapeutic yes. agents. Interesting. And drug discovery as well? Absolutely. That's what we hope. Yes. I had done an interview with the PI for Abiraterone and MDB3100, who works across the street from you, and he felt that the fact that they could use the circulating tumor cells as a way to show that the drugs work was a big step forward. And I was just wondering if you could you were talking about efficacy. If, if you could explain the different ways that you think this um, identifying the circulating tumor cells, all, you know, maybe I don't want a whole laundry list because that's not fair to you, but it seems like it has a, a lot of applications and a lot of things that can really change. So, where circulating tumor cells have a lot, the most evidence for use clinically is an enumeration with a device uh, uh, made by Veridex called Cell Search. 
And what a number of studies have shown, if you look at the absolute number of less than five or greater than five, that patients who have more than five have an inferior prognosis than patients that have less than five. And if you have greater than five, let's say 100, and you circulate tumor cells and you gave abiraterone or MDV 3100, and it went down to two, you're likely to do better than a patient who had 100 and it you know, went down to 95. So those survival curves separate and suggesting in many prospective trials that that may be a predictor of outcomes, okay? Now, whether you can change therapy based on that has not been proven, meaning that if I give abiraterone and then I measure CTCs three weeks later, uh, it's gonna predict how a patient does. Prospectively, hasn't been proven, but it's alluded to and there's studies that will be looking at that, meaning that similar to this, can you change uh, treatment just based on a circulating tumor cell? Forget about the CAT scan, forget about the PSA, forget about anything else, just CTCs, it's working, not working, we're gonna change therapy. That's coming. Now, so I think what people are really looking for, though, is the type of thing that Dr. Janikoff was working, which is more besides counting and can you really analyze tumor cells as she explained you know there's a change in tumor cell so even the patient has a ctc count of 100 and it goes down to five because it's ultimately it goes back up to 90 and they die of prostate cancer you know what's different about those ctcs why is it why if they got abiraterone or mdv or docetaxel did the CTCs start going back up? What are, are they the same CTCs or something different about the CTCs? What the mechanism? Because the only way we are going to go, which again is back to drug discovery, if we're going to make steps forward, forward, we need to know what happened. And that's the challenge. Uh, so I do think, you know, you must be talking about Howard Chair, who's a good friend of mine, and Howard's done a lot of these studies with the cell search machine, but he also has a whole area of research using a flow cytometer to separate CTCs to try and analyze them uh, molecularly to try and predict things. So it's the bar is high. I think what's crossed is the CTC. One of the problems with the cell search machine is many patients don't have CTCs on that machine. It's not that sensitive. Most of the microfluidic devices like Brian's, like Haber's are felt to be about a log more sensitive. So you can pick up more CTCs that you wouldn't pick up by cell search. Uh, cell search uses EPCAM. We're using PSMA, so it's slightly different. Uh, all that being said, those are fixed. Yeah, the cells are fixed, so they're difficult to analyze. But all that being said, I think it's the only one that's been proven in many large studies of a lot of patients that the number it does have some clinical use. It hasn't been adopted by everybody, but there's more and more mounting evidence that uh, that, that may have some benefit, you so know, for you clinical see use. It as a way to understand ultimately I would think not just what drugs work but what what is making the cancer metastasizable you know, to, well, to sort of understand the biology of it. we're more focused we're sort of focused on uh, resistance we're I'm not we don't study why you know in, in this study our group there's other people in the PSOC are studying the process of metastasis we're not studying it as much as we want to know you know, the, the evolution to a resistant cancer and why, because you know, I'm a medical oncologist and to me, you know, most of, you know, when they develop metastases, I want to treat them and keep patients alive. And, you know, as a prostate cancer researcher, the goal is to keep your patients alive so they die of heart disease. So, so yeah, I mean, to, 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 to really boil it down, what I'd say is when you, when you capture a CTC, there are maybe three or four key things you get. You get how many are there, you <coughs> get uh, what is the genetic content of cells and how have those cells evolved with time, either the DNA or the RNA. And then you get what is the, what is the phenotype of the cell, what are, you know, what are the proteins that are there right now. So if it's bigger or smaller or has, is now expressing different molecules on the surface, that's a, a way to sort of classify the basic things you can do. The, then the job of correlating those outcomes with something clinical is precisely what the, the trial is designed. In our case, there's a key thing we think is useful, which is the way that these cells respond to taxanes. And so we hope to correlate that observation with clinical outcomes, because if we do that, then that's moving down the path towards really helping a patient. And 
as I understand it, you um, you treat the patient with taxane, and then you take a sample of the blood and you take out the CTC <coughs> and then test it. This may be naive, but can you treat them in oh, vitro? Um, can you test the cells in vitro rather than doing it in the patient and see how that reacts? Yeah, and, and in fact, that, that's, uh, that's the primary source for our data. So our data is primarily in vitro experiments. Okay, so we, you're we take the cell out, and then we, then we, we give the thing of chemotherapeutic to the micro device, basically. Okay. So the, uh, the, the proposed trial then takes that directly into the patients, where we hope we'll see the same thing, okay. but we haven't proven that yet. So, you're not, <clears throat> so you don't have to treat the patient first, and, and they might have these terrible the, reactions. That's correct. Our, our hope is that. Uh, ex vivo treatment and measurement using the chip will be able to inform, will be able to predict what will really, what would happen to the patient if they were given the treatment. And again, the, the goal of the trial is to show that that's, actually, that's true. And this happens in a few days? Our experiments are done over 24 hours, whereas the clinical outcomes can be as much as three, four months before you make an observation. But again, not to overstate anything. We're not doing that in this study. Oh, yeah. We're just, we're, we're, we're validating. validating. We're validating. We're, we're, yes. This, this, is, this, is, this a, is a goal. It's a clinical research study. Right. This is one aspect. The other aspect is we have two different taxanes and trying to figure out you know, why one works after the other and, and et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of things in this trial. It's actually an interesting study. But, you know, if it works, like you say, that would be fantastic. If, you know, you can bubble The next study <coughs> will be like that. How far are you from possibly having, finding out the full work? Well, this will be a part of this trial, and you know, this trial is, is multi-institutional, it's designed to go very quickly. So in these time, we'd be doing that, analyzing the data, and then if it worked, I'm sure we would go to the next trial, which would say, okay, we're actually going to predict outcomes based on, you know, or predict treatment. Now that, concept of treating cancer cells and culture and then using has been used by many people for years but it's never been proven to really uh, you know in a prospective fashion that it really makes a difference excuse me on a simple level uh, you're going to find a very small amount of cancer cells with this device right it seems such a small amount that uh, one wonders what would be the difference between the, the uh, clinical outcome where the, the patient was going to progress into more cancer or the patient who the, the, human temp the chemotherapy is working. I mean, you, 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 you name figures like one in a billion, one in five billion, uh, or maybe one. I mean, up to 20 if I believe. It seems it's so low that how can the device actually make a comparison between good and bad? So the, um, there is uncertainty associated with that, and that, of course, is why we have to do trials to, to show over time that these, these things really correlate, and then eventually the goal would be to, to show that it can be used as a predictor in, in clinical practice. The reason why we think that only a small number of cells will actually be useful is we're really getting at the most relevant cells. We hypothesize that the cells that are circulating in the blood are the best representation of the currently active metastatic cell population. And the reason we hypothesize that is because we know the cells have to get from the primary tumor to a metastatic site or, and back and forth between metastatic sites. So the, the data to date shows that in fact that that, that works in the in the specific experiments that have been done. So, for example, Dr. Giannakaku and Dr. <coughs> Mannes, uh have used have developed preliminary data that shows that in a small sample population that they can show correlations between their observations on these circulating tumor cells and patient response to chemotherapy. So, it's a small number of cells, but they're the most important cells. But it's not that small. So, on average, from from one ML. Our median is 54 CTCs per ml. We have patients where we capture 1,000 CTCs, 1,200, depends, depending on the burden of the disease. And our analyses are geared to single cell analysis. So we, we are evaluating visually each one of them. But 
I think you're alluding to the subtext is a much bigger question. And the question is, does a circulating tumor cell, whether it's one, 10, 100, 1,000, represent the rest of the cancer burden in a patient? Okay, so that's, that's a question that many researchers are attempting to answer. And we don't know. We, we honestly don't know that yet. We know that it does reflect in many times, but we know there's a lot of heterogeneity in cancer. Uh, and you, know, you can't be 100% sure in every patient. What you pick out on the circulation is exactly what's going on in a lung metastasis or liver metastasis or so forth. We just don't know. But right now, this is our best guess that it is. Uh, for the things that my colleagues have said, reasons that colleagues have said, and uh, we and others are trying to study the CTCs and then see if does it correlate. Now, how do, the best way to correlate that is to do what we're doing. Look at the CTCs, it responds to therapy. Does the liver metastases respond to therapy? Does the bone metastases respond to therapy? Either they do or they don't, right? And then, so there either is gonna be a disconnect or not. I think the data with the CTCs enumeration suggests it does correlate, meaning that if you have a lot and it goes down, patients do better. So obviously if you're, you know, you're affecting something. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it hasn't been clear, and, and I, it could be tumor by tumor type. Maybe one tumor is reflective, and then this tumor is not reflective. Well, this is sort of a related question. I mean, you were talking about in some cases you've got a tumor burden of, you know, hundreds to thousands of these, of these CTCs. Is there heterogeneity within a single yes. sample? Yes, there is. And okay. we're able to account for that. Okay. Because we're, we're counting and analyzing each one of them. Okay, but, but you do see heterogeneity. Yes, we do. It's, not, yes. it's not like from a single patient, these all, yes. all these cells look the same. And we know from the tumors of the patients that they are also heterogeneous in prostate cancer. So the fact that we see circulating tumor cell heterogeneity is another supporting evidence that it reflects the actual tumor. <coughs> Recently there was a study that came out showed different they were called, um, PSA negative and PSA positive cells and looking at the stemminess of, of these samples. Is that expressed on, because those are supposed to be far more vigorous and they had worse outcomes, I think it was <coughs> LA. Um, is there any way that, I know you're capturing them by things that are on the, the surface. You can all, as you mentioned, you can look inside the nucleus okay. once you capture yes. to see what's going yeah. on, but to capture them. Can you capture differentially things that have been markers for these stem cells or purported stem cells? Sure. Yeah. So you. It, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. The. Um, yeah. So you you can you can enrich for cells that uh, have stem cell character. It is not as clean and straightforward a process as, for example, identifying a cell that's of prostate epithelium origin. Mm -hmm. So um, so that sort of approach is, is possible, but more difficult. And they have to be expressed on the cell surface to be able and, to yeah, capture the, them. The, right. the, re the reason why it's more difficult is, is that the, the markers that uh, identify a stem cell are less specific than the markers we're using to identify prostate cells. Mm -hmm. And a larger fraction of them exist in the nucleus. So, so a lot of, of ways to identify a stem cell include transcription factors, which are in the nucleus. Yeah. And if you give me a cell, I can look inside the nucleus right. and, and yeah, see. Yeah, to capture it. It, you could, the capture process, the way we do it, which is by having it stick to a sticky surface, it's actually a, a very naive process. Where you, you can't look inside the cell. You can only look at what's going on on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so that, that colors a little bit which problems we choose to solve. How about cathedral 11? I'm remembering that's sort of in and out. Is that? The, the cad cadherins? Yeah, sorry about that. So, so, so cadherins um, can be used as a, as a marker. Um, in, in general, in my experience and observation, the cadherins have not been as effective a mode of capturing uh, circulating epithelial cells as, as other markers for, for the epithelial phenotype. So for example, there are many devices that use EPCAP, the epithelial cell adhesion molecule. Um, people are much more likely, once they've captured a cell, to ask questions about the different types of cadherins. And usually that's asked in the context of epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is a process that's associated with the metastatic process. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say at present, cadherins are used to evaluate cells that have been captured, but are not primarily used to capture cells. I think most metastatic uh, cells, cadherin expression goes down. 
so it's part of the metastatic process. And as you said, sometimes they're in and out, so some tumors have deregulations of the pathway, so they do not express them on the cell surface. Um, I just <clears throat> wanted some clarification. So the reason you look at the CTCs as opposed to um, the cancer cells in the, in the primary prostate cancer is because the cancer patients have already gotten rid of the prostate cancer cells. Is, is that why? Well, it's yeah, typically today or over the last 20 years, patients are diagnosed with prostate cancer. They have surgery or radiation of the primary lesion and they develop metastases or spread of the cancer over many years, could be five, 10 years. The, the natural history is the PSA starts going up and then it spreads. So the, you can get archival material, meaning that paraffin embedded, it's not fresh, it's fixed material that's you know stored. And there are many people trying to compare what did we see there versus what we see now. More typically what you'll see is if you identify a genetic abnormality in the, uh, let's say, CTCs or a metastas metastatic site you biopsy, it's in a subpopulation of the, uh, you know, the primary, not necessarily in all of it, depending on what genetic abnormality you find. So there's this time lapse, and in some patients, you can see genetic abnormalities in the metastases that you don't even see in the primary. We see that a lot, uh, and there's been a number of papers showing that. So how valid is it to look at the primary tumor? to guide your therapy. And the you know, what, I, Yeah, I see patients from 1994 who had their you know, radiation or surgery back then, and I'm seeing them today with metastatic prostate cancer. Is that a good s tissue to study to guide my therapy today? Not so sure. I'm concerned about the heterogeneity in the CTCs. If you're using it to guide treatment options, if um, you, know, you treat a patient with docetaxel and then you get CTCs from him and you show, if you look at the microtubules and you show it works on some cells and not on some cells, and conversely, if you're trying you know, for a future drug and you want to test another drug, how does that help you? So that is a great question. And that's why this trial is set to validate these assays. So we're developing uh, quantitative mathematical models to see what is the threshold. How many CTCs do we need to have uh, the effect on microtubules that correlate with clinical response? So only the clinical data can help us develop this. So in this assay, we're testing and we're developing the models to see what makes sense clinically. So you can't really use it to predict which drug will work in the future because you don't have clinical data yet. Right, that is correct. Yeah. We, this, this is research, I mean, this is research. And uh, we have another study in it that we've been doing prospectively. We have 40 patients already that we've done this type of analysis as yes, of a total of 70. We haven't analyzed the data yet because we don't want to bias ourselves. With everybody got docetaxel chemotherapy. We're, you know, at the end we will look at it and see how it correlates in a small sub, which is published. I think I'm not sure if that's the paper we got, but we did show that it was statistically significant and was predictive. In 30 patients? Yeah. So you're looking samples. to see if, if a drug works in 60% of CTCs from one patient, right. then you correlate that with the clinical data? But we have to see, is it going to be 40%, 60 80 What percent is clinically important? What is encouraging so far? We have done this predictive assay in five or six patients, a metastatic receiving docetaxel chemotherapy. We treated the CTCs on the chip, ex vivo, and the next day, we did not see any microtubule engagement. And it happened that each one of these patients was progressing on docetaxel. So this is encouraging because it shows clinical relevance. The other part of the experiment that I showed you, we take the same CTCs, we treat with a different taxane, and they show response. You cannot do unless you have the prospective clinical trial, which is what we are planning to do now. So can you? Carly, that if the CTCs from one patient are heterogeneous, but they have a particular profile, that that same profile exists in the tumor, that they are the, the profile is heterogeneous in the same way, it has the same percentage of cells that will respond and not respond. We're not doing that study. That's a you know that's a detailed study to analyze. I mean, you can to do that study, you take a tumor, you'd analyze different subpopulations, you take CTCs, you do single cell analysis and look at them. 
we're not doing that. Other people are trying to answer that question. I think it's, that's one of the questions that are out there. I mean, does heterogeneity matter? Uh, how much does it matter? What's, uh, if you have one dominant you know, mutation or pathway abnormality, and you target that, does it really matter what all the other background abnormalities are? So these, those are great questions, and probably until we get to answer those, it's going to be hard to cure patients with metastatic cancer. But once you have that information, you can go in and find out what molecular mechanics are Absolutely. happening. Absolutely. And so it's, it's a process. It's just it a, is like a, a domino is falling. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So you have to say, so up until now, my entire career has been focusing on mechanisms of toxin resistance. No matter how many good preclinical models, cell models we have developed, to date there is nothing that is clinically relevant. Why? Because people cannot get repeat biopsies from the same patient at baseline after the first dose of chemotherapy at relapse to assay and ask the, these questions. So for me, the availability of CTCs opens a huge door. It's a new portal. Now I can look into the tumor cells and uh, determine those factors. And this answers the issue of that there was a study out of uh, Michael Gottsman's lab showing last year showing that the primary tumor cell type is extremely different from the cell lines. And this is working to actually move the, the study away from cell lines to patient primary. Exactly. And that's why having this is, is, is critical. Right. Otherwise, it would be impossible to have five of or ten biopsies from the same patient. Five or ten blood draws with minimal amount of blood, sure you can have. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> can I ask you uh, if uh, part of the problem in, in, in this whole treatment area is uh, drug cross-reactions uh, among patients. So patients vary so much, don't they, in, in what other uh, drugs, other drugs they're taking. Is this a factor in, um, in, in your eventually assessing what the effectiveness of chemotherapy might be? Is that the kind of thing that cause, will cause difficulty for you in kind of extracting results? I think uh, you're talking about other co-drugs that they're taking. Yeah, I mean, there, there's many things. You know, as an oncologist, there's, we know that there's many things that affect you know, how patients do with chemotherapy. And some proven, some suspected you know, drugs that they're taking that can affect the metabolism of, of, of uh, the chemotherapy. Some say some tobacco, if you can have lung cancer, you continue to smoke. You do worse with chemotherapy than if you stop smoking. It's probably the genetic makeup of each individual in terms of how they metabolize drugs, and we know that certain polymorphisms are, you know, inherited. Not, I don't want to say defects, but it just inherited variability uh, of individual patients can affect the metabolism of certain drugs and affect toxicity, may affect the efficacy. So there's many different things that come into play. For small studies, you know, th those can be important when you think of the studies, what we call the level one data, the phase three trials, the big trials, you know, the thousand patients, the 500 patient trials, those effects get diluted out. So if there is really, uh, you know, a benefit, you will see it. Uh, that being said, there are again, you know, there's a lot of research trying to try to ascertain, you know, some of these other things. Many studies we do today uh, are very restrictive of which co-medications patients can take and they, uh, because of the interactions. Um, so it's something we're aware of. Uh, in this particular study, it's not a part of this study per se, uh, but it's absolutely true that there are many factors that affect outcomes related to an individual patient that are not accounted for. Can I ask, uh, is this uh, test, uh, does it have any potential to substitute for PSA tests in the long run, in any way? So there's a lot of uh, data. In, a sh in short, yes, um, hasn't been proven yet. The PSA is not that reliable in many different studies, many studies. Uh, we've shown that relying on PSA to predict outcome is probably not a good idea. CTCs look like they may be one possibility. It hasn't been accepted or proven 
universally, or hasn't, I should say, hasn't been proven enough that it's accepted across, um, you know, the medical oncology field or by the FDA as a surrogate. It's moving in that direction. And again, that's just enumeration. More and more, uh, when we define response to patients, PSA is only one piece of the puzzle because of its unreliability. And I think most of us in the field, with all these new drugs like Abiraterone and MDV3100 that target the androgen access, you're going to see patients who progress, then their PSAs don't go up because you're going to knock out, the PSA is driven by, by androgen, you're going to knock out PSA. Uh, it won't be going up, but the patient's still going to progress, so it's, it, it may not be a good marker. So whether this will replace that, it's possible. I mean, people I, like Howard Chair are working in that direction trying to prove that may be better than PSA. Some people think it is. And uh, along no. these lines, on the PSA, you know PSA is the target of the androgen receptor going to the nucleus. So more recent data have shown that there are different forms of androgen receptor in metastatic prostate cancer patients some of these forms are predominant and they do not induce PSA, which could explain why clinically PSA is not the best marker. What we're proposing to do, we're looking at all the androgen receptor <coughs> forms as to whether they're in the nucleus or not. So potentially, it could be a more robust assay. Could I, could I just follow up with that? You, you haven't mentioned how big this device is, but uh, I understand it might be like tiny. I'm sorry, I missed the exact dimensions right now. Sure. So, yeah. So, so the 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 device itself is one approximately one centimeter by two centimeters. So that so that's very small. Um, that's in a housing right now. That's about an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And uh, there's associated equipment that's about the size of a shoebox. Uh, so that's the form it's in right now. Uh, there's certainly potential for that to be mini miniaturized. So as is, it's small enough to fit in the clinic. There's the potential for that to be to be miniaturized, but that sort of miniaturiz miniaturization is is not what it's not specifically associated with right. this trial. But there's potential, right? There's, there's 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 definitely potential, and in fact, that for um, for uh, for many years, one of the key uh, ideas behind microfluidic devices has been this lab on a chip paradigm. The idea that you would take all that functions of a of a lab and put it into some small device, right. and there's so good potential to do that. Here. that for my iPhone, which would uh, allow me to prick my thumb and test for prostate cancer cells running around in my blood and Is that right? I would love to be able to do that. <laughs> Actually, let me tell you what we're uh, thinking to do. We're going to develop an iPhone app, so we're going to be uploading CTC data and ask users or gamers to identify CTCs based on the criteria <coughs> that we're going to, to pre-specify. It is called crowdsourcing. So we're very uh, excited about this. Should we, should we do one more? And then, can you just say what you said again? So maybe you can check. Um, so I was inspired by a recent talk by a neuroscience professor at MIT, Dr. Song. Um, he's doing uh, neuronal mapping. So he was giving us an example saying like, how many person years would it take to map one cubic millimeter of the human brain? And his calculation was 6,000 person years with manual analysis, or maybe 600 person years with help from artificial intelligence. How about crowdsourcing? Um, so they upload data and users go and they trace the neurons and you can have much more robust analysis from uh, the, the community. There's a precedent for that, it is called Folded. A group of investigators uploaded the, the crystal structure in, of a protein that they could not resolve the structure in the form of the puzzle, and the structure was solved in a few days. It was published in Nature and Sexual Biology with uh, I don't know how many hundreds of authors. Can I just ask? Is there a potential here for taking some of the blood and removing cancer cells from on an ongoing basis every two weeks? Or something? It, it, it's a very compelling idea, and so you, you could you could think of that as being the, the cancer version of dialysis, right? Instead of instead of removing toxins, you could r remove the circulating tumor cells. As as exciting as that is, I I would caution against saying that this device could be used for that purpose. And, and the reason is just because 
part of the reason why this process works well is because we're getting uh, access to very easy peripherally available tissue, right? We're just taking blood from the arm. If you try to just take blood from the arm and have that, and with the idea that that would remove all the circulating tumor cells, you would be ignoring the fact that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in all sorts of all other parts of the body, lymph nodes, et cetera. Uh, and I would caution against uh, advertising the potential for that. It's a super awesome idea. But it's a super flower in the future, I think. It, it, uh, it, it, we, we can't claim that we'd expect that to work on the, until we know a lot more about the way these cells move around in the body. And I, I, would, I don't think we're in a position to, to make such a claim. Uh, one more question. I, I just have a question for you, Dr. Kirby. Could you tell us a little bit about the process of how you all got together and how comparable people like you up in Ithaca or, you know, how do, how do you figure out what's, you know, who needs you or, you know, there, there has to be some structure or maybe you need a structure. It, it's just, it seems fabulous that you all got together. Sure, I mean, I, I, can, I can talk a little bit about the structure and I can tell an anecdote or two about, about how we actually connected. I mean, we, although, the, although we're far apart, we have a number of things that connect us, shared interests, shared infrastructure, et cetera. And so, uh, for example, there are proposal mechanisms that uh, the, where the medical school and the, uh, the university in Ithaca team together, and so the Physical Sciences and Oncology Center is one example of that. And in fact, in the years that that uh, uh, grant has existed, the formal structure of how we work together, at least at cancer, has been primarily structured through this, uh, this mechanism. Um, you know, anecdotally, the way we connected, connected, at least as I recall, is that uh, we historically have had a series of workshops designed to bring the two campuses together. And as I recall, in early 2008, I attended actually a lung cancer workshop. And it was designed to get a bunch of people together to talk about lung cancer. And so I went and I gave a talk about tuberculosis because I wasn't doing anything about cancer at the time. And so I, I gave a talk about how I was uh, moving cells around and analyzing them. And then I got an email from, from David saying, hey, I, I'm really interested in this different problem, which is the circulating tuber cells. Can you do it? And, and in fact, I think my first response was that I didn't have any interest in doing it. <laughs> but, then, but then I thought about it for a while, and I thought maybe I should, I should be interested in it. So I and said to Brian, well, we have an antibody Neil Banner that will just get prostate cancer cells. So oh, well, that sounds more interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so th oh, that's specifically how, how we connected, and um, and so it was actually who we connected before the PSOC was created, and then the PSOC has has um, has built upon that. I think the fact that I spent my sabbatic here really built on that, uh, and in fact. I think this is a compelling story of how the two campuses can work together, but there are also many other stories of, of groups that are working together. Just one more thing. Uh, the $12 million, is that enough? Is it just for this device, or is it for the overarching research? $12 million. The, 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 the PSOC grant is, is, involves many, many, many people. So this and is a small slice of the PSOC. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so, so what we're doing is a small slice of the PSOC. And the, f the support that we've gotten from PSC is a small slice of the support we have to do this work. Do you have so enough? No. No researcher will ever say that. Is that a loaded question? No. Send money soon. I'll give you, I'll give you a website where you can make a donation if anyone would like the website. Do you have a website? I, I do have a website. With a, <laughs> it's a Kirby, kirbyresearch.com. And only two clicks and you can make a donation. <laughs> I spent a lot of time coding that up. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard anything from the general public then? We, we do. I mean, uh, the, I mean, I think that the, the sources for, and um, my colleagues can, can collaborate on this, right? I mean, the, the places, the things that fund this research are, are federal institutions, pharmaceutical companies, uh, and, and donors. And so the people who are trying to do work that helps people are, are looking to get support from all those areas. You so haven't got the general public clicking that like some rich uh, dot com guy clicking it. I mean, okay. no, no. That's why they want articles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, we, I have a number of grateful patients that are interested yep. in, in giving Mark money. Millican. 
Uh, well, uh, this work was partially supported by the Prostate Cancer Foundation, as a matter of fact. It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got a, what did we get a, uh, what kind of award? You, you got an award. award. Yeah, I got, I got an award that we were all involved in to study this. So they're well aware of what we're doing. Well, I'd like to have this conversation go on and on, but I think that, that some people may want to leave. But thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.